All right, class, welcome to week seven of the quarter, and we'll be looking at Old Testament law in this session. So uh, this is uh, a tricky part of God's Word for a lot of folks, uh, and I always feel like there's more that could be said, more that I want to say than I have time uh, to say in these sessions. And this is certainly one of those sessions that I, I feel like requires uh, more time than we have. But hopefully we can at least uh, scratch the surface and get a good start. Um, one of the challenges of Old Testament law is that you have some strange things. You have hard questions. Uh, one of those common questions is what applies today under the new covenant and how do we know and how, how, do, how do we apply it? Um, you have what your uh, authors call the weird, <laughs> Exodus thirty four twenty six, do not cook a young goat in his mother's milk. Um, at Leviticus thirteen forty, a man who has lost his hair and is bald is clean. Uh, you have the easy, easily violated law, uh, Leviticus 19.32, stand up in the presence of the aged, uh, Deuteronomy 22.5, a woman must not wear men's clothing, nor a man wear woman's clothing. You have the familiar, uh, like Leviticus 19.8, that we find repeated in the New Testament, love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, so let me let me look at a couple of these I'm with you for just a moment um, and try to help you think about what's uh, behind and under some of these laws that we need to uh, go go deeper with. Um, take that that first one, Leviticus 13, or, or no, uh, Leviticus, uh, no, not Leviticus, Exodus 34, 26. Do not cook a young goat in his mother's milk. Now, I don't know about you, but I've never struggled with that. Um, I've never been tempted to uh, cook uh, a baby goat in its mother's milk. In fact, I've never cooked goat, although I hear it's very good. Um, and, of course, eaten a lot in Latin countries and in the Caribbean. Um, but that's never been a struggle for me. So you might look at a law like Exodus 34, 26 and say, hey, that doesn't apply to me. That has no relevance to me. Uh, how would I ever teach that to people in my, in my church? Well, one thing to remember with a law like that is, again, we want to go back to step one of the interpretive journey and ask the question, what did it mean in its original historical context to Moses, who wrote it uh, from God, Exodus, how did the Israelites in the Exodus uh, understand that law? What was its purpose? And uh, get what's behind that and why God would give such a law. And if you do, uh, you know, a, a background study on that verse, you'll find that in pagan cultic religion of the time, that cooking or boiling a young goat in its mother's milk was uh, often a pagan practice, even a form of false worship, a sacrifice to false gods. And so in part, it's believed, uh, as I understand it, that that law is prohibiting uh, false worship, a specific form of false worship that was familiar to Israel. Now, I would ask this question, do we still have problems with false worship? It may not be goats in milk, but we absolutely have problems with false worship still and false religion and pagan practices. We also find that beneath that, if you think about the uh, step, uh, step three of your journey, crossing the principalizing bridge, that underneath this law, there is something being communicated about God. 
there is something about his nature, his character, that is being revealed and affirmed by that law. What is it? Well, I, I think it's the holiness of God, no doubt. Uh, it's also that God is the only God. He is the one true God, and he is to be worshipped as he has commanded. We are not to make up worship as we go and to worship God the way we want to. We're not to worship God creatively and according to our imagination. We're to worship God as he is prescribed in his word. So if I come to God with a young goat boiled in its mother's milk as an act of acceptable worship, God will reject that because he did not command me to do that. So God is holy and God is one God. He is the only God. We are a monotheistic faith. So what is behind this is something that's revealed about God, that God must be worshipped as he is prescribed in his word. And that we should not be uh, taking pagan practices and pagan religion and pagan worship and introducing it into uh, worship of the true God. Now, you can probably see there are lots of applications that can come out of that in our context, if you understand what's under that law. It's something about God, brothers and sisters. And so in that theological principle of, of the bridge you cross in the interpretive journey, I want you to focus on identifying uh, an attribute of God that is being revealed by these laws. Uh, let's take another one. Um, let's take Leviticus 19.32. Stand up in the presence of the aged. Okay, so today, is that a law that is in for, um, uh, for us in the church? And the answer is, I would say yes, uh, if we understand the in intent of the law and what's under it. The, the relevance of that law is still as applicable as it was when Moses wrote Leviticus. Because what is God? Um, well, let, let's st start with step one. How did the original audience understand that? Well, the elderly, the aged, those with you know, gray hair or no hair, <laughs> um, we, would, uh, we would recognize that they are advanced in years, and we would say uh, when we're in their presence, we should stand uh, in their presence. Um, we, we know in our cultural context, that's kind of been a, a traditional practice uh, of various kinds of, in our culture of showing respect. And there's all of this comes from biblical culture in our context that's being lost in our day. Now, uh, what's beneath that, though? What's being communicated? It's one that God is showing that Human beings are made in his image. And as his image bearers, um, God loves human life and he confirms in his word that humans um, with age should have acquired wisdom and a position of authority and respect that should be acknowledged by younger generations. Um, so in that, God is saying things that communicate to us today in our doctrine of humanity, and that should we still have in our churches uh, respect for the aged, respect for our elders, respect for our parents and grandparents? Is that just Old Testament law that doesn't apply anymore? Of course not. This is a principle that can be transferred into the new covenant because, friend, even though some of the details of these laws in the old covenant context have changed, God has not changed. And humanity has not changed. So let's take Deuteronomy 22.5. A woman must not wear men's clothing, nor a man wear woman's clothing. Now, 
Many of you will know that in some churches, uh, women are not permitted to wear uh, pants. Uh, they should only wear dresses and skirts. And some traditions, of course, are still very uh, firm about that. Uh, you may like or not like that or agree or disagree with that. But let's think about where they got it. They looked at commands like this and they said, the Bible says that um, men shouldn't dress like women and women shouldn't dress like men. Uh, I think that's still true, but let's get beneath why. It's because, again, human beings are made in the image of God. God created humans. God designed gender, binary gender. There are only two genders. I know we don't know what boys and girls are in our world today, but God does and has given us clear instructions about males and females. So does God still care about men looking like males and women looking like females? Yes, he does, because God hasn't changed and God's uh, design of humans hasn't changed. Uh, those are those, those overarch the Old and New Covenant because they're rooted and grounded in creation, which is a permanent institution, a permanent design, and in the nature and reflection and character of God. So I think you get, I hope you get where I'm, I'm coming from. We want to look at all these laws, even laws that we would say have been fulfilled in Christ and are no longer binding on the new covenant believer and say, ah, yes, but what is beneath and behind and holds up that, you know, un, that, that, that law in the old covenant has not changed because God has not changed. Now, your textbook uh, touches on a subject that you do need to be familiar with in this subject of law. In the traditional approach among Protestants, um, there is what is called the, the, uh, the tripartite division or understanding of law. Three categories of law uh, that have been recognized by many scholars in the Old Testament. They've looked at the Old Testament law, and they've said there are moral laws, civil laws, and ceremonial laws. So the moral laws were defined as those that dealt with timeless truths regarding God's intention for human behavior. Civil laws were described uh, describing aspects that were normally seen in a country's legal system. So a moral law um, would be considered by some to be Leviticus 19.8, love your neighbor as yourself. Civil or, or the Ten Commandments, those would be considered uh, moral law. Civil laws are those that uh, are laws that were given to Israel for the governing of the nation. Civil, um, in one of the civil laws uh, we find is Deuteronomy 15.1, at the end of every seven years you must cancel debts. That's an example. <coughs> Ceremonial laws uh, were defined as those that dealt with sacrifices festivals or the feasts, and priestly activities. A ceremonial law, example, Deuteronomy 16, 13. Uh, Israel was to celebrate the festival or feast of tabernacles or booths for seven days. Uh, and then, um, so traditionally, those three divisions of the law are understood like this. Moral laws are universal and timeless, it's been said. Civil laws apply only to ancient Israel, the governance of the nation. The ceremonial laws apply only to ancient Israel and therefore have been fulfilled by the sacrifice of Christ. Now, the problems that your authors point out with this, and, and I'm generally in agreement with them on this, um, even though I come from a um, background uh, and a perspective that would uphold the tripartite uh, division of the law, that threefold division, which I think in some ways is helpful to see the different types of law that God gave. Um, some of the problems are as follows. Some have argued that the distinctions between the laws are arbitrary. But that is, it's difficult to determine which category some laws fall into. Um, we have to also understand that uh, God gave his law in Israel's history during the Exodus, the wandering, and the conquest. 
and it's interwoven, inter, interwoven tightly with the Old Covenant, which is also called the Mosaic Covenant. Now, the Mosaic Covenant is tightly associated with Israel's conquest and occupation of the land. Um, we find in Deuteronomy that the blessings and the curses of the Mosaic Covenant are conditional. You can read about that in Deuteronomy 28, where God gives blessings and curses uh, to his people under that covenant for their obedience and disobedience of that covenant. Now, as we read the New Covenant, the New Testament books uh, under the New Covenant, we find, especially in the book of Hebrews, that the Mosaic Covenant is no longer a functional covenant. It is obsolete. It has been fulfilled. Um, in, it has been, you could say, abrogated or superseded by uh, the New Covenant in Christ. Uh, so the, the Old Testament law, in one sense, as part of the Mosaic Covenant, is no longer applicable over us as law. It doesn't have direct jurisdiction over us because we're not under the old covenant. However, um, we take the new covenant and we read the old covenant through those lenses, and we must interpret the law of the old covenant through the grid, or I would say lenses, of the New Testament. So as you look at um, Old Testament law, you want to follow the interpretive journey and you'll find a lot of help. And I, I, I think I, I agree. I agree with the approach that Duval and Hayes are taking with this. Um, they mention on page 358 of your textbook uh, that we, they say, we simply do not see a clear distinction in Scripture between these different categories of law. We also question the validity of dismissing the so-called civil and ceremonial laws as not being applicable. All Scripture, all Scripture is applicable to the New Testament believer. We maintain, therefore, that the best method of interpreting the law is one that can be used consistently with all legal texts. Now, they mention on page 357, the previous page, at the top, um, Earlier when I said that uh, many Christians have become uncomfortable with the threefold approach, they said the, uh, the distinctions between moral, civil, and ceremonial laws appear to be arbitrary. There is no such distinction in the text. For example, love your neighbor as yourself, Leviticus 19.18, is followed in the very next verse by the law, do not wear clothing woven of two kinds of material. They ask, uh, so should we see verse 18 as applicable to us, but dismiss verse 19 as non-applicable? Well, the text gives no indication uh, whatsoever that any kind of interpretive shift has taken place between the two verses. So Duval and Hayes are arguing, I think, rightly, that all law is theological. All of the law had theological content. The question becomes, can a law be a theological law, but not a moral law. So that's what we're talking about here is we're saying all scripture is relevant. And I do not want you to dismiss the Old Testament. And I don't want you to dismiss Old Testament law. Just because um, the command to not wear clothing woven of two kinds of material does not directly apply to the Christian under the new covenant. That command was given by God for a reason that reveals something about his unchanging nature that though the law itself has changed uh, in, in the covenant crossover, in the river of differences, you might say, it does reveal something about God's nature that has not changed. Why did God give commands like that? Well, I think we would find uh, that it has to do with the holiness of God, the holiness of his people being distinct and set apart. It would have uh, show us that God is uh, showing his people that they're to be, di to, to be distinct and different and not be mixed, uh, intermarried with Canaanite peoples and mixed with, uh, with, with Canaanite religion. And there's all kinds of theological things behind that because God is communicating that his people are holy. 
So how did this law, we should ask, relate to the Old Covenant? What exactly did it govern? What did this concrete expression of the law mean to the original audience? So I think of the, the laws in the, in the Old Testament that um, I can't remember the reference right now. But God commanded that his people put a fence or a wall, a barrier around the roof of their homes. Why? Because God was wanting to keep people safe. Because people go on the roof and, you know, eat and activity would take place because it would be flat roofs, as you still have in much of the Middle East. And you say, well, what's that all about? We don't live on the roof anymore. We don't do things on our roofs. Um, no, we don't, but we do have building codes. And where does that come from? It comes from a reflection of God's law. Why? Because God cares about human life. God cares about image bearers. He cares about humans because human life is sacred. We believe in protecting life from the cradle to the grave, from, um, from conception to natural death, right? Well, should that not be reflected in the way that we uh, manage and steward uh, our lives, our families, our churches, and our society? Uh, yes. Um, so even though in step two, we no longer live under the specific terms of the old covenant, and we're not preparing to enter a physical promised land here, and we do not live under a theocracy here, uh, we must recognize that these laws still have relevance. And in step three, when we cross the principalizing bridge, we're asking what is the broad principle that God has, be has behind this text that allows for this specific ancient application? Principles often reflect the character of God, the nature of sin, or concern for other people. Those things, my friends, have not changed. So you can teach Leviticus to your church, and I hope you will. You can teach Exodus and Deuteronomy to your church. And under the New Covenant, with New Covenant lenses and the grid of the New Covenant, as you look elsewhere in Scripture, and you consult the biblical map in step four, uh, you'll realize that, you know what? The Bible speaks all over the place about principles that are rooted in that text. Uh, you can see in other places in Scripture that God talks about His holiness. He talks about the image of God. He talks about creation. He talks about concern for humans and his, and, or, or, um, or, or sin or whatever the issue might be. Um. And then in step five, we grasp the text in our town. We would apply the principle um, of the text, the main point of the text, to specific contemporary situations. One thing I want to uh, uh, see more of in some of, of your work is our specific scenarios and applications telling people exactly how they could apply and obey uh, and integrate uh, the text today, okay? So don't, I mean, step five is very important. You can't take it until you've done steps one through four, but make sure that you do it. You complete step five. So, you know, these, these commands, I, I, hope, I hope that this chapter, this discussion will open to you a whole new world of, of interest, desire, and a renewed understanding of the Old Testament so that you can appreciate that you don't skip Leviticus, brothers and sisters. You simply have to know how to read it as a Christian and to give priority to the New Testament and just simply look at it through those lenses of the New Testament and say, okay, this is what it meant then and there to the author and audience. These are the differences. This is the theological principle that hasn't changed because it's rooted in God's nature. This is where the Bible speaks to it elsewhere to support and confirm and illustrate. And then this is how we obey it and apply it today in our context. This is what it would look like. So I hope this has been helpful for you. And I look forward to um, seeing uh, how, just how you continue to grow and apply these things. Hope you're having a great week, and I will talk to you next time.